Okay, well, let's get started. These things, we usually sort of feel our way into them. Um, these topics were self-generated by uh, uh, David's, what the community might be interested in talking about. And he and I sort of cooked it up together. And the guiding uh, notion this evening... Oh, here's Paul. Hey, haven't seen you around. Did you just get back? I got to Amsterdam last night. Last night. Yeah, like a lot of other people. It was a wild <laughs> night. That's going to be really good. Oh, great, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Lock the front door so people won't be coming in and out. Yeah, okay. This door, don't walk through it. If you think you want to go through there, instead go around to the other one. <laughs> that was very helpful. <laughs> uh, David, did you want to introduce the theme? Yeah. Good. Uh, Do it. I actually made a few notes. Um, I suggest that the idea of talking about insanity it has a lot of um, personal meaning to me, aside from what I, the value I thought it would have for the group. Um, I thought one thing to... I was thinking about why do I want to talk about this to begin with. And for me, there's a way that I have this continual desire to somehow create an environment that somehow really is safer for myself, somehow, some way that I can feel that um, the way that I express myself will somehow not result in me being ostracized or in some way otherwise sort of bottled up and packaged and sent off somewhere. I have this fear of, um, of what I'll call insanity. And... Um, <laughs> And I feel that this is something that really affects everyone in um, most of their daily life. It, it, I think it does mine at, at, at some subtle levels that we don't acknowledge enough. So I'd like to talk about sort of what it is to begin with. What is it? Uh, what is insanity? What is this fear that I have um, about crossing a a line at which point I would be um, really ultimately somehow ostracized in some way. And how that stops me from growing in general. Um, so I have this desire somehow to you know, kind of expand um, my own awareness, other people's awareness enough to um, allow, so that it, that it would allow more for myself and that I would feel in some way more free to explore areas that are frightening to me otherwise to explore. Um, and I wanted to mention um, a personal example for me. Um, um, about two years ago, um, for those fortunate or unfortunate enough to find me, I would, could be seen in the garden at Esalen talking about God um, in a rapturous way. Um, um, one of my fears of... Arnie Mandel was here about um, a year ago or so, and he asked, in one of our processes, he asked us to go around the room sort of and actually to pair up and tell our partner, if we were to go crazy, what form would it take? And um, my idea was of being a religious fanatic in some way. I have this thing, among other things, that um, there are areas that I've sort of experienced um, for myself, and for me it's been through drugs, um, mild drugs, I might add, um, where I've seen things that I've shut off and have felt in some way I haven't been able to integrate 
into my ordinary life. And I have this fear that um, for me to explore that area further might result in me um, walking, not only walking through the garden talking about God, but um, um, I might be discovered. I was lucky, not too many people saw me that day. Um, and uh, I think that this, um, there's something in general taboo about behavior, of, this is obvious, about behavior that just isn't um, norm enough. But what I'm struck by is how low the threshold is for myself as well to tolerate behavior that isn't ordinary enough. I mean, I'm very quick to say so-and-so is weird, or so-and-so is off, or... And, um, you know, this is part and parcel for myself, this judgment that I have of other people with the problems I'm sure that I have with um, allowing myself to be not ordinary. Um... So I think, you know, there's a lot of issues to talk about when we talk about insanity. I've, from what I've said, there's a lot of ways to go. Um, uh, I could say more about what I've said. Um, I'm really interested in other people's experiences um, where they felt that they're, where they're, those of you that are afraid of going crazy in any way, what that means to you. Um, I find, you know, as I'm talking about it now, I feel vulnerable even, you know, talking about this experience, which I'd uh, be open to going more into uh, detail about, but uh, by way of introduction, that's sort of where I'm at with with the issue. I'm trying to find ways to um, allow more for myself and not be afraid of um, that if I explore too much that um, it'll be too much that I'll be you know ostracized Um, I think the whole word taboo is is relevant and and, and I'd like to you know to talk more about that for that to come up for people what what their idea of taboo is and, and um, how maybe that relates to insanity. Um, it's like there's also this distinction between if I'm on to something that's real, that's far out, that's weird, that's somehow uh, the difference between creative genius and being a fool or being crazy or being pathological, that's a haunting thing. It's like um, in either case, if I were on to something that was real that maybe could be useful to other people, I still might be vulnerable to being um, called crazy and maybe I have fear of being destroyed by that or something. And then I have the fear of that I'm, I'm wacko, that um, I'm, on, I'm not on to anything that has any relevance to anybody else and that um, it's totally my own trip, and um, I would be more what the kind of person that I look at and I say, oh, that guy's just a little, that guy's got a loose screw, or that guy's off the wall. And so, but in either case, I'm looking to find a way to have permission to be either of those things, either the fool or, you know, or onto something that's maybe useful for other people. And how, in either case, to you know, to reckon with my fear about being ostracized. Yeah, well, I mean, I sort of think along these lines, although a little differently. Three times you used the word ostracized. Um, What I'm always afraid of is that I'll be ostracized, except that it'll be entirely deserved. In other words, that 
going off the deep end into some kind of appropriate behavior. The word that I would use over and over again is disgrace, that it would disgrace everything. And as I've, and it's gotten weird for me because uh, there used to be nothing to disgrace because there was no reputation. Now I'm always aware that, you know, if I go bananas, then people will say, you know what happened to that guy? You know, you think this is good? You, she, you read these books? Did you hear how this guy ended up? Uh, so then it's all ruined. It's like they're saying about Woody Allen, his entire work must now be reassessed. And you think, oh God, what if that were me? You know, your entire work needs to be reassessed. Um, and it's interesting to think about madness, or what we're calling madness. I mean, I've also, the religious thing is the one that overcomes me or overcame me. That's how I imagine I would go. And even as it is, I'm practically a repent, the end is nigh person. I mean, it's all couched and we have the computer and the mathematics and the dazzling, uh, you know, uh, rhetoric. But it's basically a, the end is nigh uh, rap of some sort. And yet I, I'm very intolerant intellectually. I mean, there are, there are perfectly harmless functioning people that I, in my own mind, consider crazy simply because of what they believe. I mean, you know, one way of thinking about crazy is it's just you have looser rules of evidence than the rest of us. So, uh, and in a society falling to pieces like ours, where nobody has a very firm grip on what's going on, you know, if you're nuts, but you're not sure you're nuts, you just have to get ten people to believe you, and suddenly you're a method, a school a point of view, you're not nuts anymore, you're invited to teach your insanity and show others the way. Um, but I think there's an unmistakable threshold that when, I think people who are um, insane in the way that you're concerned about and that I'm concerned about, know it. It's not something, and, and I think Dick was the great exemplar in this area. I mean, he was nuts and he knew it and he managed it and worked with it and got juice out of it and was sometimes overwhelmed by it um, because it's a feeling, don't you think? That it's a, it transcends intellectualizing. One can believe all kinds of odd things, but there's a certain existential intensity that overcomes you and then you are crazy or insane because you it's it's almost like um, with psychedelics or practices that are very powerful you do begin to rise through some kind of spiritual domain but if you're unbalanced slightly to one side or the other, you'll start to skew and it'll get worse and worse and it will feed back negatively into your life. And, uh, you know, insanity is a kind of like a divine madness of some sort. I mean, it's, a, it's not clear what it is exactly. I mean, I think people really do touch extraordinary states. I'm not a psychotherapist, so I haven't seen like hundreds of people who were diagnosed as mad, but these people who go off the deep end with religious ideas and so forth, it seems to me there's more going on than a disintegrating psychology, because it's always accompanied by events in the real world which reinforce the crazy assumption it's like, from the point of view of the person who is undergoing this, there's ample evidence always at hand that they're not crazy, that this is really happening. 
I remember when I was at my most uh, unreclaimable, you know, one of the things I would do, it was in the Amazon, and very fortunately, because modern mental health care delivery systems couldn't reach me, and so I survived it, but otherwise I doubt that I would have, because when they drug you and interrupt these cycles of whatever this is, then it's very hard to ever get straight again but the form that my madness would take I mean on one level was I would go into I would go alone into the jungle and um, I could call butterflies to me which was a strange thing because I had earlier made my living as a butterfly collector and so I would just like St. Francis, I would go out and hold up my hands and the butterflies would come and descend like an, and walk on my hands. And I would... Oh, oh yes, no, <laughs> this happened. I mean, nobody was there but me. But <laughs> And, you know, we can even create an explanation that I was able to generate an odor or something that brought them in. But so then I would have like an epiphany it would prove to me my divine nature and the, my divine mission and so forth and so on. And so then I would sink to my knees, the butterflies surrounding me, and weep with the ecstasy that I had been granted this sign and you know, then weep a little more. And, but then the mind would begin to wander and then I would think about how, but, but nobody else is... Uh, is getting the benefit of this miracle. And so then I would dry my tears and go look for somebody to show this to. And then I would take these people who were by now fairly concerned about my state of mind anyway, and I would w insist that they walk with me into the jungle, and then I would hold out my arms to the skies expecting butterflies to descend and envelop me. And of course nothing would happen. And then people would just turn away, you know, aghast at such a display of hubris, ego, fucked up, uh, delusory, just that you'd lost it, you know. You would become unbearable, egomaniacal. And then you say, but no, listen, it's really true. And then it's even more pathetic. And so there are, you know, cycles of distancing that go on. Um... I don't know. I, do, I think it, in the course of a life lived to its fullest, most people have these pass through these places on some level or another. Is that generally agreed upon? Is this totally wild territory to everybody here, or no? No, it's pretty. Yeah. You know. But I'm raising the issue of leaving. You know, not exactly passing through, but you know, for myself, leaving something unresolved that still needs to be integrated. And I imagine you have this with places that you've been to, Terence, where this, in some way it's, it's, not, um, it's not resolved and to go. And my fear is to explore too much is, is um, you know, a ticket to... Um, You know, a crazy bomb of some kind. Well, leaving consensus. I mean, I think you. I think it's true that you know, with psychedelics, um, the practice works too well, almost, in that it it will. If you insist on, I don't want to use the word abusing it, but if you insist on using psychedelics frequently at high doses, back to back, you will unlock your way into a, into a, a set of assumptions and perceptions and feelings that not very many people can follow you into. And then the question is, uh, you know, have you gone into a spiritual domain or have you just fallen off the track? And it's hard to tell, and maybe it can happen both ways. Uh, it's so hard to convey the mind of the schizophrenic. I mean, 
people who we call crazy do not seem to themselves to be crazy. They look at the world through a, from a different perspective and through a different logic, but they're trying to make sense of it. It's just that the data that they're trying to handle is extremely uh, alien from what the rest of us use. I mean, I can remember when I was in the States that I would, I would um, it's so hard to explain, but I would like see waves of historical association out of my past. I mean, it's like I would be in a small town in Colombia, but something would, it would be as though there was another time, a time from my past overlaid over everything. And so uh, a waitress serving me in a restaurant, a hotel keeper, would also be a, another person in another time, in another place, with a set of associations to me. And I f- had a friend, actually, who was became schizophrenic and did get electroshock and the whole nine yards. And he said, you know, what you have to do, what you must do, is learn to shut up. You know, do not run around. And it's all, and it's a, it, there's a compulsion to confess as well. This is not easy because there's something about these perceptions that have to be communicated. And yet when you communicate them, you know, people are appalled. They do not know how to handle it. I remember when my brother did what he called turning inside out. And, you know, he didn't know whether he was Agnes or Angus. And there was some intimation of some psychosexual transformation. It wasn't clear whether it was like a transsexual operation or the metamorphosis of an insect or something else. And, you know, he's saying this. I mean, I don't know. Um, I suppose we can multiply these examples endlessly in thinking about this talk. Uh, For me personally, what it comes down to is somehow, and I don't know the how, but the issue is clear, I think. It's an issue of of courage and of failure of nerve. You have to... um, you have to be willing to put yourself on the line. And it's all tied into what we always talk about in these circles, which is the ego and how the ego's final defense against its own dissolution is telling you that you're either going mad or dying. And in the psychedelics, you know, you can usually defeat the dying rap because you just have to have the faith that you're not dying on 15 milligrams of psilocybin. It's highly unlikely, not impossible, but you can argue that it's unlikely. But but when it tells you you're going mad, you have nothing to stand on because you can't tell. Who knows? I mean, what is the effective dose of psilocybin for triggering madness? The question doesn't even exist back in the world you left behind. And... The only way I, you know, Shakespeare says, screw your courage to the sticking point. The only way I've found to deal with this is the rough, personally speaking, the absolutely rough straight ahead way, which is after putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, I finally just say, oh, fuck it, you know, do it, you know, if that's what you want to do, if you want to destroy me, do it. But it requires, you know, it's a kind of recklessness. I can't find a calm place in which to meet it. I can only meet it if I force myself to assume that it's going to leave me high and dry. I remember um, a a psychotherapist, who I don't want to name, but who used psychedelics very 
extensively for years and years and turned on hundreds of people and with combinations and all kinds of stuff. Toward the end of his life, he, 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 it grew harder and harder and harder for him to take it. And when I asked him why, he said, um, I always have bad trips. And we talked about it, whether that, that it was, you know, um, that just a lifetime of tripping other people had done this, or whether maybe as you pass a certain age, it doesn't do the same thing, it becomes darker and darker, or whether it was something in his personality. I really resist the idea that you could ever get to the place where you say, as some people love to say, psychedelics, I took them, don't need them anymore, learned what it has to offer. But uh, one reason, I mean, I one excuse that I use in my own inner rhetoric is that, you know, sitting here in this moment, I can really strongly imagine what it's like to be stoned on any one of these things. It doesn't feel remote to me anymore. And I don't know whether that's a delusion and an excuse for not doing it, or whether my thresholds are getting... uh, getting lower I don't know I was in London a few weeks ago and at a party and I was the guest of honor and they brought out last year's Welch mushrooms and made a big tea for everybody and the hostess said you know it's it's just it's just almost like a gesture I mean there are so many of us and so few mushrooms but we'll each just get a little bit well, so I was first out of the shoot, and uh, you know I was uh, I don't know whether it all pooled on the top in one place or what was going on, but you know I just sat down on the ground, and this guy who said some person of great reputation who said he'd wanted to meet me for years and years was sitting in front of me, trying to get to know me, and and finally he just said he said. You're flaming, aren't you? And I said, yes, I can't carry on this conversation. I just have to hold on to the grass. Well, I don't know uh, what all this means. I don't want to become afraid of it, and I blame myself. I don't think the thing has a negative edge unless you've somehow come out of jiggle with it. And I don't know whether that means, you know, what does it mean if it becomes harder and harder to take these things? Does it mean you're getting out of balance? Does it mean you're just getting older? Where should the blame be put? And then what can you do about it? The only thing i found to do about it is stop running and turn and face it. But each time I do that, it seems to require the very limit of my courage and I don't know how long one's courage lasts. Uh, maybe it's not a bad thing. I mean, after all, people who climb mountains like Mount Everest, they don't do it till their dying day. At some point, they, you know, knock off and become a consultant for a sportswear manufacturer or something. Well, what does anybody else uh, think about any of this? I'm getting agitated. Oh. I'm getting really agitated because, you know, I don't, I don't know even what you're talking about, except that you're, you're talking about having your mushrooms and you're having these experiences. And I've never taken drugs in my life, ever. And I've had just normal, or just abnormal, you know, kind of breaks. <laughs> and I'm having these things, and I'm not eating anything, it just comes on, and it's very scary for me. And from the time, you know, and David, I don't really feel for what you were saying because I'm scared to death. Because since I was like 15 and, you know, in, in high school, and then they sent me to the hospital, and the psychiatrist got hold of me 35 years ago and did a number on me. And, you know, quickly I learned that when, when, that, when the experience comes and that I get scared, I go back to that doctor. And I did that until I came to Esalen seven years ago. And... When I came here, I came to meet Dick and work with him, and I 
asked him to work with me, and he took me under his wing for six weeks and worked with me every other day. And what I had then, David, was I had permission to go through it, and he was going to be there with me. And then Dick died. You know, we hiked Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On Monday, he said to me, "You're going. Are you ready to go up here by yourself? Because you know, pretty soon you have to go alone." And I said, "I'm not. I don't want to go alone. I just want to be with you." And then on Wednesday, he died. And I'm haunted by that because, you know, I keep coming back to Esalen, and and they say, "Well, Dick's dead now. You know, this is not the place for you to go through that." And I said, "Well, where in the fuck is the place to go? Because there's so many people here that." want to go through to this other side. I don't want to do it living in my van on the streets in San Diego. I don't, I mean, it's not about me telling people my experience. Sometimes the actions look pretty bizarre to the people out on the streets, and I get to the point where then they, you know, they're alarmed, and they Hold me back. Uh -huh. Right, and you know, I'm not walking around telling them that, so it's like, okay, am I, you know, if I'm living away from Esla, well, even at Esla now, because last year I was having a break, and I, I went to jail in the lodge, and I was really scared, and I was reaching out. And she said, well, why don't you go to a movie in town for a few hours, and then see, you know, and that was the wrong thing to say. So I, I terrified, and somehow ended up in San Diego in the hospital, got on some new kind of medication, you know, and, I, and that's been the pattern, too. But when Dick was here, and I felt like there was, you know, a support to go through it, that felt okay, you know. And then, now when it comes up, I do get scared. And I don't go through it like you just suggested. I, I go back and, you know, take a drug. And I haven't been on a drug for ten months now, and I'm back here, and I'm terrified that, that you know, when it, if, when it comes up, I'm going to have to run away. You know, I don't feel a support anymore here. And, 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 and what haunts me is that Dick wanted to have that. You know, that was his dream. I know he's dead and it's not his place anymore. But, you know, his dream was to have a sanctuary where, you know, right down there in that canyon, he talked to me for six weeks about, you know, like putting me in on the deal. And, you know, I'd be the first one he turns loose in there like they did with him. And that you wander around and have all kinds of experiences. And then if you come out fine, and if you don't come out, they could ship you off up to the highway somewhere. Until you're, you know. Well, but, but in fact, most people came out fine, I think. No, all these drugs, these psycho anti-psychotic drugs, are basically warehousing strategies for the convenience of doctors because the only way that works with people who have this problem is so labor-intensive and so demanding. I mean, what you need basically is six people to watch you, to some to hold your hand and reassure you, some to physically grab you and sit on you when you head for the hills. Um, uh, very few people get through it without being messed with. Like I say, I think I was lucky and my brother was lucky because some force, some intuition led us to get so far out that they couldn't find us. You know, they literally couldn't come and get us. Uh, R.D. Lang, as well as Dick, had this idea that people have to go through it. Um, but not everybody can go to the... I can't right now go to the jungle. I mean, I'm, I, I well, well, you've got to, what you've, you've got to have some kind of a support yeah. group. And if you don't have a support group, then you have to stay away from people who will mess with it. And, you know, it's hermit time, if nothing else. Yeah. There are several places now open. One is called Pocket Ranch in Geyserville. It's four hundred and seventy-five dollars a day, and I've been crazy since I'm fifteen, so I can't even get insurance that would even pay for that. So it's kind of for people it, it, that are rich. No scholarshiping. Well, no, I don't know. That. No, they don't have anything. Because Steve gave me some brochures when I found out about that. You know, and Medicare doesn't pay for that. I mean, I'm on disability for psychiatric problems. You know, from Social Security, and you know, they don't pay for shit, you know, which is good in a way, because I don't get too many drugs that way to cover it. Well, you know, it's hard to tease apart whether they're, whether you've got... I mean, I think it's amazing to me that at Esalen that we're discussing insanity. It's even, I think, a kind of an old-fashioned word. I mean, you'd think this would be the thing they would have worked through here. Isn't that what... I mean, it was Steve who said to me once, uh, 
you'll understand this place a lot better if you think of it as a kind of hospital. And I've, you know, looked at it like that ever since. Uh, we have all these therapists. The greats have come and gone of three schools now. And we don't understand it. So what can we expect from uh, the rest of society? I mean, I, my, when I was schizophrenic, if this is what we're talking about, my feeling about it was, and maybe this is, if not true, a delusion worth playing with, is I thought, aha, what we call mental illness, what we call schizophrenia, <laughs> and what we look into the body or the mind, or the personal history, or the dream state to try and understand and possibly cure, it's not like that at all. It isn't your... If you're the person who's nuts, it isn't your problem. It's something that's happened to you. Not more fundamentally than catching the flu... It's like you just happen to step in some cosmic doo-doo and now it's on the bottom of your shoe and everybody's pointing at you and backing up. But it isn't your fault. It was just happened to be in your path. It's a kind of... Um, it's a horrible piece of luck unless you can turn it to your own, uh, to your own advantage. And what that means, I think, is obviously integrating it. Well, then, how do you integrate these things? Uh, um, I think it has to do, again, a lot with where you start from. Just speaking from my own personal experience, what saved me was my cynicism. Uh, that I didn't believe in anything, never had had always thought believing in things was a bad idea. So then when this whole cosmos of beliefs was handed to me on a platter, I just simply s said, maybe, you know, I'll act it out. But I won't, I won't believe it. And I think that had I been a good Mormon, a good Catholic, a good Buddhist, a good something else then I would have been lost because I would have traded whatever it was I believed for the new set of beliefs. As it was, I just said, you know, what's this? Beliefs. I don't do that. But I played with it and somehow the playing with it was able to depotentiate it. Uh, I had a conversation with someone very recently who by ordinary standards, I think, would have to be considered nutty as a fruitcake. And, uh, you know, they could hardly speak of their condition without being swept by an emotion that was so intense that it reduced them to tears, you know. And I said, you know, if you're going to be this nuts, you should enjoy it more. You know, it's too... And they said, you know, I am enjoying it. And I said, well, I'm not enjoying it because you're just projecting such an emotional intensity that it makes me very nervous. And I think I'm generally... I speak then for the same general masses about that. What makes it hard for the person who's going through this is that it's so hard for other people. I mean, it's freaky to be around somebody who's crazy. I don't, you know, because I'm such a purveyor of psychedelics, people are forever leaning on me to trip with them. And I dare say, you know, there are people in this room who've known me for years and no one here can say they've ever been seriously loaded with me because I just don't do it. I can't take it. I can't handle... Um, the feeling, the feeling of risk that permeates that. That's why it amazes me. I, I'm fascinated by people who have such faith in their knowledge that, that apparent difficult situations don't freak them out. As an example, some of you know Frank Barr. He's an emergency room doctor. 
And I'm amazed that he can deal with people who are dead out unconscious and just say, she'll come to in 40 minutes or so. Don't worry about that. When I would be frantic. I mean, if I can't get a reaction out of somebody, I just go berserk. And uh, uh, the notion, I don't know whether that's a kind of callousness. Therapists are like that. I mean, they say, you know, you come up on somebody flopping around on the floor, screaming, pleading, weeping. My inclination is to make them feel better, for God's sake. And a therapist would just say, well, they're working through their stuff. (laughs) It's all right, you know. Uh, How do you get that level of self-confidence where you can see somebody in agony and say, that's all right, it's the best thing for them. Check on them in an hour and uh, see where they're at. It's awfully... uh, So I stay away from it. And in my own situation, I keep people away from me. I've had many trips where I've thought in the middle of it, thank God there's no one here to see this. Because if there were someone here to see it, I'm sure they would become alarmed and decide that some crisis was in progress. And, you know, ultimately, you have to sort of get a kind of perspective where you just say, if I die, I die. Uh, But it usually has to slam you to the wall pretty severely to make you turn. The image I have is that I run from it until I become so furious at this humiliating situation that I turn and face it. And then, you know, if you curse it, it will step back sometimes. I mean, it's worked every time. The other thing is, you know, the wonderful (coughs) instinct for equilibrium that the human mind has... uh, that you can get pretty twisted around. And if you'll wait 24 hours, 72 hours, 10 days, 6 months, it will restore to equilibrium. I'm puzzled by the cases of permanent raving madness, and I wonder how common they are. It's all messed up in this society. I mean, I can show you psychiatric residents who have never seen an unmedicated schizophrenic in their entire life, you know, because you just they just do not encounter people in that state. What they deal with are people who come in and been given drugs and kept on drugs and drugs, drugs, drugs. That's the whole uh, the whole dynamic. Yeah. Thinking about the last person here that the community really got behind sitting for um, through a, through a stay of this. I'm wondering how much to say because she's not here, but um, perhaps the reason we don't know more about this is, as you say, how many psychiatric residents have ever seen somebody who's not on a caretaking drug. Mm -hmm. And the amount of energy it took for the community to mobilize to take care of this person was pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It takes a team of six to 12 people. Day in and day out. Day in and day out, and this went on for 10 days or so. Mm -hmm. 30 days. 30 days. And was there a resolution that was satisfying? There was a resolution of sorts, but the thing that I was most impressed with is in a psychiatric ward, among people who didn't know the person, you would have assumed that all these associations were meaningless stuff, and that this person was the person had been in, and the review of the material, it all made sense in a particular way. And that would never be, that would be completely missed. There was definitely a way that a lot of stuff was being worked through, maybe not to satisfaction, but on some level, that you couldn't possibly know unless you knew this person very, very well. Yeah, that's exactly what I saw with my brother. I mean, when my brother went bananas, I sat... And, you know, it was a complicated case because there was something wrong with me in the sense that I didn't sleep for 11 days. Just, But he raved day and night. And what in every single thing was, 
or, or to my mind, at least 90% of it was incredibly interesting and revelatory. He imitated every relative. He imitated music teachers not dealt with since age six. He revealed vast scenarios of stuff going on in the town where we had grown up together. Well, if he had been straightjacketed in a ward somewhere, they would have just thought that this was garbage. And what it actually was was, you know, brilliant, uh, insightful, almost literarily deep stuff. Um, and the other thing is, I've always thought, you know, uh, that a mental ward, I don't understand the thinking of the psychiatric community. A mental ward is my idea of an environment designed to drive you crazy. I mean, because crazy people drive me crazy. Just one who is very slightly crazy is unbearable. And to be put into a ward with people wandering around, and I really think it's a pheromonal that there... I don't want to go as far as some people have gone and say that schizophrenia is entirely a pheromonal disorder. But do you know what I'm talking about here? Well, some people say that... Uh, there that we have left over from earlier stages of evolution all kinds of physiological systems that produce odors that we are not consciously aware of but that like set the ambiance for social interaction because we are after all social animals we're as social as honeybees or something and all social animals regulate behavior through pheromones and it's known, for instance, that um, when a person walks into a crowded room, instinctively the first thing they do is they take a deep breath. And it's thought that this is a whole bunch of chemical messengers are coming in saying, you know, people have been drinking, one couple isn't getting along, somebody's on the make, so, so all this stuff is going on and you get this gestalt in one single moment. Well then because of a phenomenon that's fairly common called allophrenia, which is where your friend gets committed to a mental hospital for schizophrenic behavior, and you buy a book and take it to them and visit them, and while visiting, you behave so oddly that you're not allowed to leave <laughs> allophrenia schizophrenic behavior by non-schizophrenic persons in the presence of schizophrenia. Uh, it's thought that perhaps what schizophrenia is is an odor malfunction where the person who is becoming schizophrenic is literally beginning to smell funny. And this causes the people around them to begin to send the wrong signal which begins to activate anxiety in the schizophrenic person, which accentuates the production of the pheromone. So then people start saying, you know, that guy's really weird. He's so weird. Well, then the person picks up on this. And what's happening, your word, ostracized. They're being pushed to the periphery of the social thing. And they feel it's unfair because they... And the people doing it don't know why they're doing it. And what's happening is it's a horrible misunderstanding and it ends in making somebody completely dysfunctional because they don't know they've lost their place in the net. They literally don't know who they are. And yeah, there, there's, you're pointing out like a fragile and kind of a desperate nature of consensual reality where there's a desperate grip on this consensual reality and when that starts to slip, when people feel that that's slipping there, there's some grabbing that goes on in the And that's the response that you're talking about. Yeah, that it's somehow we're all anxious about this. I mean, consciousness, after all, is probably, you know, less than a hundred thousand years old. So it's... And we're losing it all the time. I mean, like when you get, when you deal with these real nightmare trips, like the Jeffrey Dahmer thing, the reason that's so horrifying, I think, is because it's a loss of any value that you can relate to. It's like the real darkness 
rises up and you say, you know, it's all so fragile, you know. If we stopped loving each other or even just talking about how we should love each other, then, you know, cannibalism, murder, sacrifice, death. I mean, inevitably, these really horrifying mass murder things are, are very primitive in some sense. I mean, dismemberment and so forth. It's fetishism. It's a activation of primitive forms of behavior. So I think the anxiety we feel around these issues is because um, m- mental clarity, sanity, belonging, these things are fragile. And we've each earned it. And it wasn't easy. And, uh, and so we're anxious about our purchase on it. You know, I always felt that in the 60s it was so clear to me when LSD was around and that I would debate it with my parents and and people were talking about whether they would take it or not, that the people who were alarmed by it were alarmed by it because they self-diagnosed themselves as insane. They knew said, you know, we don't want it. Are you kidding? A drug that opens the doorways to the inner world of the mind? No, thank you. You know, that's the last thing we're interested in. Uh, And they were right. You know, they had no business fiddling with that. Well, we're the children of those people, and in some cases, you know, maybe those people ourselves. So it's, um, it's very dicey. I really admire people, I don't understand these people who just take these enormous doses of psychedelics and it just beats the shit out of them and one week later they're back ready for more, you know. They don't, I mean it's like they're made of different stuff than I am, don't they understand, you know, that it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't, I mean I admire them, I just don't have that kind of stamina. I take it too seriously. Alan, did you want to say something? Well, I was confused by what you were saying. Who are you referring to that does this? Which? It takes huge doses and it slams them around. Well, I know people who just describe outlandish trips and then they say they'll be doing eight grams again and looking forward to it. And I know one person who says... Each time I take it, I try to stand more. And I have the feeling, you know, that it's very coddling of me and that I sort of march around inside the um, hall of mirrors because I can say to it, stop coddling me. And after 30 seconds of what happens when I say that, I'm saying, coddle me, coddle me, enough already, you know. Because it, it begins to go fugue-like and lift these veils and you say, oh, you know, it's, it's um, I don't know, maybe I read too much H.P. Lovecraft as a kid and it contaminated my categories. Uh. Yeah, it's something that um, David said that um, is sort of away from psychedelics but on, on this vein of... Um, discovering something that maybe we, um, maybe I keep myself from. Some, not just your normal discoveries, you know, but those real choice little cherries. And I, somewhere I have this, it almost seems like it's a tape that says, well, if you know that, and if you claim it, then how will you fit in the rest of the world? And I, it's like a stop measure. I don't know how to explain it, but when you were talking, I was really, I was really getting that, <laughs> and I was hoping I could share it. And, you know, I haven't ever really talked about this with anybody, so it feels real. It does feel vulnerable, but um, aside from that, it, it seems like there's something that that. Um, is remembered when I have a revelation or when I, I uh, really understand something, you know, like I cognite with something. 
it almost feels like it's a, a, a memory that's come back. And, um, you know, again, I'm speaking of, uh, I don't even know, of the, of the real choice mysteries that, you know, kind of keep ourselves from right somehow. And, and I don't know, I guess I just wanted to share that, but maybe what experience have you had with that? Or but that's a positive, it's an uplifting experience, right? Um, the stopping isn't. Talk more about the stopping. Um, well, I, I guess I get to a place that is um, almost like, um, well, what I see are, are lots of different uh, past lives. I don't even know if they're past lives, really. I can't even categorize them as that, but I, I see different symbols and different um, relationships to civilizations. And, um, you know, just kind of I sense things that I knew or things that, you know, were available. Things that are available to all of us on an on a even, even greater scale. Sort of some universal or even, you know, some people call it the Akashic Records or something. But not to be too, too much in that vein. And I'll start, to, I'll start to grasp it and I'll start to maybe um, claim it or understand it. And then I'll get this, I'll, I'll get sort of this imbalance going, or maybe it's, you know, my, my thought that, um, you know, if I have it, then I won't have this place in the world, you know, or I won't have a place in the world that, you know, that nobody else is like me. You mean that you'll learn that something that will set you so apart that you'll not be able to fit into the world? Yes. I, for me, um, there's a, I have a horror, horror sometimes of, of the sense of when I come down, as I start to come down, of the certainty that I'm coming into illusion and something that is essentially meaningless compared to where I just was. So a horror of return. <laughs> well, it's a horror of that I've somehow created a universe that is like somehow it's my fault that I'm returning to something that is less than what it might be or what it could be yeah. or what you saw it to be in that state mm-hmm. and, then I, and then I will gradually forget and, and experiences of gradually forgetting even that yeah. well you know I don't Maybe we're a special slice. I mean, there is the notion that, first of all, it's a monkey brain that we're operating with here. Nowhere is it writ large that it can actually encompass the truth. I mean, why should it? I mean, do we believe that banana trees perceive the truth? They're flatworms, so why should monkeys? So then if you're into these consciousness expanding techniques whether they're just simply paying attention or using psychedelic drugs or something else then you actually get to a a place where there is you know it's like an abyss of knowing it's like um You know that poem that says, um, I look over your meaning's edge and feel the dizziness of the things that you have not said? Well, that's about a relationship. But it could also just be, I look over meaning's edge and feel the dizziness of things unsaid. It's that nowhere is it writ that the universe should be rationally apprehendable. And maybe when you get the distances and the energies and the time scales, when you have even a remote intimation of these things, it's your mind can't handle it. You know, it actually implodes under the force of uh, of reality. I mean, I sort of feel like that. That what we have uncovered with all this thinking and exploring is not 
the white light or some cheerful Buddhist hypostatization like that. But what we've uncovered is ungodly complexity. I remember once at the height of an LSD trip years ago being with somebody who yelled out, I'm drowning in the spaghetti of ambiguity. I know that feeling, you know. It's just that, you know, you, you, it's all very cut and dried. It's, you know, and then you start delving and you start, you know, reading weird literature and taking strange drugs and going to strange places and you begin this deconstruction process. And what you find out is not only that the world is weirder than you can suppose, but that this situation is fundamentally alarming that the world is stranger than you can suppose. And, and it carries an, an existential implication. It does for me. I mean, I'm, I, I, uh, you know, I can't believe anymore that, the, just now speaking of the psychedelics, that this is about human psychology. You press <coughs> it too hard and go too far and I always think of that amazing scene in Rosemary's Baby where Mia Farrow in the middle of this dream sits up and says my god this is really happening and that's the 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 thing which lies behind all this delving that you know the cheerful assumption that it's all mental and that you're going to return to reality, and that the here and now is the stable part of the mandala, you know, it may not be true, or it seems to me that it's not necessarily true. And then you just say, you know, you could find out something that would make it impossible to speak to anybody, you know, that you would just have to turn away from people with an unspeakable truth and be isolated by it. I wanted to ask a question that came up for me last weekend. Mm -hmm. You said that when you took DMT to the shamans in South America, the Ayahuascaros, and they said that it was ancestor spirits mm -hmm. were coming through, a comment, I, I believe I heard you say this, that the Ayahuascaros seemed to be more interested in using the Ayahuasca or the medicines they had for more like a doctor would. Um, what what that that is uh, how I've used them. I would say more like a helping someone. Mm -hmm. And wh how you use them is more for an inquiry, like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Is one more of a psychological approach and one more an intellectual? I'm just, I'm curious. Well, yeah, I mean, one is a shamanic approach because the center thing of shamanism <laughs> is healing. I mean, that's really how you judge a shaman in, in a traditional fashion is by healing. And then this other, you know, it is intellectual. And it ha and because the idea is to, to be able to say something. And I guess maybe where the problem comes, and I'm blinded to it because I have the problem, is that you it, it's you have to have heart a lot of it i mean maybe more heart than i'm able to muster and that if you try and do it through the intellect alone it becomes um i don't know there's some mythological metaphor here but it becomes titanic it becomes dangerous and possibly uh, capable of collapsing upon itself. Maybe the healing is the way you pay your dues and that somehow curiosity alone is a, a false coinage and that the lack of the desire to heal is the manifestation of the lack of heart. I mean, I don't know. I just know, you know, that... If you have a heart mission, I think it's easier to travel those rails. Anybody else?
Yeah. I was just yesterday confronted with this accident on Highway 1 here, which was pretty major. And somebody um, died in a burning car wreck. And um, they had ground process. Um, I realized that how traumatic that was for me. And like how the whole day before I was kind of like everything turned gray and I was really um, trying to get out of it. And it reminded me of, not only for myself, but like sometimes you see something that's just like so horrible. We feel you have seen too much and it makes you insane. And um, I was just wondering about that, you know, that connection that that you maybe witnessed something as a child or at war or wherever that is just so horrific about the potential of, you know, the human race or whatever happens that you can't fathom it, that you can't, you know, try to leave. And you mean, and then you're like contaminated by this image. Yeah, well, I think a lot about that kind of thing because, uh, you know, one of the things that the that has been established through places like Esalen, I think, and rightly so, and 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 correctly, is that images can heal, and that visualization can promote health and and this sort of thing. But what you never hear discussed then is the implied uh, opposite which is that some images can harm and that information has a quality of harming and hurting. We are the inheritors of Lockean theories of government and so our approach toward information is, you know, free speech and anything can be said. But... uh, I'm, I don't know whether this may, I mean, I feel very um, sensitive to images. It's a kind of funny thing. So I don't, I, like I don't own a TV simply because I think it's a source of toxic imaging. And, uh, you know, one of the forms that the encroaching madness induced by the psychedelics takes I've noticed is that you are open to invasion by images that are loose in the mass consciousness Uh, you know on three separate occasions I've seen people freak out on psychedelics um, about Charles Manson either they thought they were Manson or they thought I was Manson or they thought (laughs) something you know well it's clear that this is toxic information that moves around in the body politic and then is magnified under certain circumstances. Auschwitz, uh, all of this stuff, uh, and all the images of sadomasochism and and all, uh, all uh, and our society seems more into this than any in history. I read a really freaky thing. I mean, I don't even understand some of this stuff. I mean, this is my idea of toxic information. Maybe some of you saw this. It was in Time or Newsweek, around the time of the Jeffrey Dahmer trial. Norman Mailer wrote an essay on on the psychotic as harbinger of future style and said, you know, the psychotic is the role model for the future. And like I say, I can't even understand what this stuff means or who understands this, but I didn't think it should be said. I thought, you know, this is the raving of a diseased mind and now it's in the bloodstream of the culture. Huh? Yeah. And... uh, uh, it contaminates. A whole culture can sink into madness, you know. I mean, you know, we like to think we're in a terminal phase of decadence, but, uh, uh, 
you know, the Roman emperor Heterogabulus used to castrate his lovers and hurl them out on the front steps of uh, the official residence uh, to be found in the morning by the street sweepers. We have a way to go before we get to, to those places. Uh, but still, uh, maybe it's because of Freud and Nietzsche and... Uh, uh, all the bad boys of the 19th century or something, but we really have pried open a, a fairly toxic aspect of ourselves. And in the name of facing ourselves, we, uh, we tend to uh, make ourselves more ill, I think. I've always had trouble uh, with Stan's theory about the unconscious and... And I can't go to those slideshows with the crazy... I can't take it, you know? And I don't know what that means about me, whether it means I'm sensitive or feel threatened by all that stuff, but it just seems to me unnecessary and and uh, unhelpful. Yeah. I, I found that to be true, too. Six hours of that type of slideshow was... Too much. Well, and when you hear about somebody like Salvador Roquette, who will take, you know, a room full of Jewish women from Yonkers and give them 500 micrograms of LSD and then show Auschwitz army footage of Auschwitz, you think, you know, this is my idea of hell. This is exactly what I don't want to get near and would expect to emerge from severely impaired in my personal uh, progress, you know. This is kind of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all, there's a lot of, an impulse in a lot of schools of psychotherapy to rub your nose in it. And I, I don't know, you represent a school. How do you see that? I don't know what your school's position is on this, but do we have to rub our nose in it or we miss it? Or what's that all about? I can't, I'm not going to talk in terms of the school, but if I take psychedelics, I go out in nature. And so you're I'm okay so, there. And I'm okay there. And so that what I don't want to amplify won't happen. That's what I first want to do. I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine doing that or exposing it. I can't imagine taking a thousand micrograms of LSD in this room at night. Right, that would be too would be profaning. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's my own personal. But it isn't, you, you can never insulate yourself from it. I mean, I've had trips on about nature that are sort of along the lines of, uh, you know, the life cycle of the alien. And it was all about the how it was a vision of nature as this thing feeding upon itself and how egg cases were being inserted into tissue and free-swimming life stages were attaching to tissue and pathways were being... I mean, it's a yuck image and that could come easily out of examining uh, six square inches of soil under a redwood tree. Uh, it isn't always affirming it's like there's a balance in your own perception that if it's thrown off a sunset can drive you into uh, despair what is the general i mean there's a lot of expertise in the room is it useful for us to go through these darker sides of ourselves do we feel better afterwards or does bringing it to the surface Bring sh then you have shit on the surface. So. I, I personally think because it must be my German heritage. <laughs> I like to go into those places and like to discover those dark sides of my soul or whatever it is. You know, I like to really rub my nose into it to just because usually if something isn't a part of me, it doesn't touch me. Uh huh. You know, so if something touches me in a way, I like to go to the root of it. And what is there when you get there? 
I mean, what the, what's the experience, in other words, of instead of saying, oh, no, not that, my God, saying, oh, great, a chance to understand more about myself and rush in. What do you find when you get in there? Um, I just find that I get a, a, a more complete picture of the whole. Uh-huh. Like, I, I feel like I get, you know, the karmic wheel. Uh-huh. Like, I'm, I'm discovering every aspect of it in, in, instead of just... Heading for the light, and gives me a better understanding of human nature, of the, of the human psyche, of my own psyche. Yeah, well, I think you. I don't think it's pleasurable. But is it awful? Um, it's awful if you make it awful. It's, it's awful when you put a judgment on it. So the trick is to just not judge it. The trick is to just not judge it and just see it off the, uh, the other side of the karmic wheel. Well, I think that's what I do, but I it I feel, you know, it's a struggle to not judge it. You say, oh God, if I judge this, it will get worse. I should just try and ride it through. I'll give a try on the, on the, on the school part of it. Uh-huh. I mean, I, and then what's haunting me is this picture of having these women from Yonkers take 500 micrograms and watch this stuff. I mean, there is this modern pop psychology idea, some of which is to the monetary benefit of therapists, that wallowing in this stuff gets you somewhere. Mm-hmm. And um, my current thinking, which is always, of course, subject to change, is that very fine edge between not denying something and not wallowing in it either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a very difficult That's a good point. Thing. Yeah. Allowing. Yeah. Allowing. That's what I mean. Do you trust you stay the observer to it? You uh-huh. know, you, you become the witness to it and without judging it as good or bad or whatever it's just So a kind of detachment. Yeah. Well even it's more than different. that from the Gestalt perspective, which I'll represent the edge between wallowing and I mean, you don't ever want to deny, but you want to go into something far enough to begin to get a reversal. Mm-hmm. begin to get the other side. Mm-hmm. So, from a theoretical thing, I don't know how wallowing would ever serve that purpose. So what you're talking wallowing. about, though, is coming to a sense of balance, right? Ultimately. Well, it's, it's being able to integrate and mm-hmm. accept all of the various aspects. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but wallowing, obviously, is not coming to a point of balance. What you're talking about with the women from Yonkers and the, you know, watching the, the film, I mean, that is... You don't come into balance by assaulting your psyche with everything that is the most horrific that you could possibly confront. And I think that can be very damaging, and probably more so to some people than others, because people's tolerances are different, people's individual place of balance is different, and um, so I I think there is a lot of individual variation, and it's very subtle and it's very delicate. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree that toxicity is toxic in whatever form it comes, and if it has that effect, I do not see benefit in that. Well, perhaps a better word than wallowing could be formulated. It's just the one that I chose. But in in dealing with psychological material, you're mostly dealing with something that's already happened. So why would you ever want to stay in something that the outcome is predetermined, that you already know the end? Mm -hmm. Most people are most afraid of what they've already experienced. Mm -hmm. So why would you want to spend a lot of time hanging around in a bad place that you've already experienced, that you already know the end outcome of. But you also don't want to deny that it happened. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of edge. That may be a better way of saying Mm -hmm. To begin then to get a reversal. Yeah, I think we all have a sense of that there should be a balance, but we all have a different sense of where it should be. I mean, for instance, I... I feel some I feel mild irritation with people who don't like uh horror literature. But I don't like slasher literature and I'm very clear what the difference is. I mean one is uh psychological and the other is science fiction. And but but I can't put up with you know, Silence of the Lambs and from there on because it's offensive. But on the other hand, if somebody doesn't want to see Alien because they say it scares them, 
I think that they're a nervous Nelly, you know, and that they should actually steal themselves to this experience. And it's good to watch Alien because you learn something. <laughs> well, I guess it, it, it confers an immunity. It's one of the reasons why people know. It's a feeling that it confers an, uh, some sort of uh, immunity by having undergone it. Maybe that's why people are into all these affectations of negativity. It's a kind of sympathetic magic. So maybe this is why adolescents who feel tremendously empowered are into, you know, t-shirts with dismembered bodies and, uh, you know, bands whose images rotate around themes of mayhem, incest, and destruction. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, uh, counter charm. And in that case, it shouldn't be put down. These people are not sick. They're doing something to keep from being sick. You know, they're gaining confidence by associating in a familiar manner with the things that actually make them very nervous and uneasy. I mean, I don't know. This could be cheap shot. Uh, but I, I tend to... I mean, I would stick with that for a minute. I tend to think that's true because uh, I know some of these people who are behind all of these symbols and they seem like very nice people who are striving to keep their lives together. I mean, my son is one of them. Uh, Every time I have an impulse to condemn, you know, it is pretty horrific. I mean, my son brings home um, uh, CDs and I read the lyrics and it is a jaw dropper what some of this stuff is, you know. But then if you actually play the CD, you discover that the lyrics are so lost in walls of noise and special effects and all this other stuff that it isn't as in your face as when you read the the lyrics. And in any case, you know, um, nobody's ever topped that Doors song about murdering your father and screwing your mother, and that was the anthem of our generation. So who are we to point a finger at uh, Guns and Roses? Or, I mean, and, you know, we think of the Doors as a wholesome impulse or something. I don't know. Some incredible mental sight of hand goes on here. Sympathy for the devil. All of this stuff. I mean, it's black in that phase. But if you're in it, it's fun. It's theater. It establishes a ring past knot that keeps the boring people out. If you're on the outside... You know, this is pathological, demented, it leads to mass murder, and it's unacceptable. Well, you've got to go easy on some of this. Anybody? Where do you stand to judge anything is, is, is what comes up with that. Right. I have a question about Prague. Uh-huh. Um, the conference that was held there, not the, not the advertised conference, but the one that was not advertised. Uh-huh. What was the outshoot of that, if you can talk about it, as far as the future of psychedelics in this country? And will they be made legal again at some point? Or do we anticipate that? Something's going on. I don't understand. There's some kind of high-level policy review underway. Um, it's hard to figure out what is happening at this moment to motivate it. Uh, maybe it's that Europe is actually moving closer and closer to legitimizing research and it would it just puts pressure on the American scientific establishment. Uh, you know, Rick Strassman has been able to do his DMT study in New Mexico. Uh, that Ibogaine study in on the East Coast is moving forward on the flimsiest of evidence. I mean, I don't believe for a moment that Ibogaine interrupts morphine addiction. I think it's a brilliant ploy for getting a research program funded, but just the evidence, I don't, I don't know. As I understand it, it's one guy's sort of personal revelation. Um, 
I don't know, it probably depends on whether or not there's a change of administration. In that, if there is no change of administration, you can be damn sure there won't be uh, an era of psychedelic research. What was the conference? Then? What was that conference? Well, it's the ITA, with the International Transpersonal Association, and then there was an, an unannounced conference um, headed by Rick Doblin right. of MAPS, multi Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And I was just curious. I haven't heard anything yet from that. They had a lot of people there. It was... Essentially, the international psychedelic community is still defining itself because you get, there's no consensus about methods or materials. I mean, some people are using ketamine in psychotherapy. Other people regard it as a veterinary anesthetic. And, you know, you can't tell who's got it right. But... I think the maturity of the European research community is just sufficient that they're probably going to restart it. And then this country will have to decide what it's going to do. Anybody want to say any more about this? Let me see if I wanted to say any more about it. It made me think of a funny cartoon, the whole subject of madness. Maybe some of you saw this cartoon in The New Yorker a few years ago, but a bunch of obviously very straight businessmen are sitting around a conference table and they have the downward-moving chart of their company's profits up on the wall in front of them. And the CEO is saying to a smiling man sitting at the end of the table, it's true, Headley, a deliberate derangement of the senses worked for Rimbaud, but would it work for us? And uh, it's worth remembering, you know, that this madness we fear so much, we are essentially the unhappy inheritors of the romantic legacy. I mean, they brought this upon us. This is what they wanted. They worshipped this. And the entirety of the 20th century has been a deconstruction of gentlemanly reason. Uh, um, abstract expressionism, all of these things, Freudianism, Jung, National Socialism, it's all anti-reasonable. I mean, from the point of view of the 19th century, we don't have to worry about madness. We are mad, every last one of us. I mean, we've so thoroughly imbibed the the values of modernity that we are incomprehensible to our own past and uh, this brings up the issue of you know someone said it was a problem of consensus what do you do if the society is crazy then what happens to the concept of madness 